Now, I want to review some scriptures I shared last week from Psalms 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with singing. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights and hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. I put over these scriptures the Davidic pattern because Davis gave, David gave us a pattern for how we would enter into the very presence of God. The Bible speaks of David as a man after God's own heart. He followed God, was very sensitive to God, and always wanted everything that God had for him. And so we shared how the, the children of Israel had lost control of the Ark of the Covenant at one point in their history, which is the very place where God's presence would dwell, and that would be where they would put in the tabernacle of Moses, in the most holy place, this very important part of the tabernacle where the presence of God would descend upon it. It was called the mercy seat. It was called the throne of God. But in time, they had lost it. They had retrieved it, but never brought it back to its proper place of function. It's amazing how oftentimes in church history and in the history of the house of Israel, how oftentimes people neglect to do the things that God has for them. We need to make a choice. We're not neglecting anything. Amen, church? We want to be a people that says, we want everything that God has for us. So one day, David brought the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, and he brought it to the place where they could set up an order of worship and praise around it. He literally formed an orchestra, a choir, as we would call it today, and there was 24-hour-a-day praise and worship there. It was a place where people rejoiced in the presence of God. David was a praiser. As a matter of fact, when they were bringing the ark in, the Bible says that he danced before the Lord, and he danced so much that his coat fell off. His wife uh, didn't like that too well because she was more dignified, and she kind of gave him a, a dirty look and was like, hey, that's not a way a king's supposed to act because her father had been a king, and she wanted to keep up that tradition. But he let her know, hey, I'm going to praise the Lord with everything within me. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Oftentimes over the years, people have talked about Pentecostal charismatic churches, how they get a little too emotional. How many you know when you love somebody, you get emotional? <laughs> Anybody want to love without emotion? No, we don't at all. Amen? But we've been sharing how important it is for us to see this pattern that we should come in singing to the Lord as we come into the house of God, shouting joyfully to the rock of our salvation, coming before his presence with thanksgiving, shouting joyfully, and this is what we call praise. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart into his courts with praise, is the way David said it in another place. But ultimately, there comes to the expression of our understanding of who God is. He is the great God, the great king above all gods. And then it begins to describe him. His hand is in the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his. And then with this awe-inspired revelation of who God is, we come to this place of worship. And worship isn't where we're just expressing things about what God has done, but we're awed by the very presence and the reality of who he is. And so it's not a sense of a feeling when we come into worship. It really should be a sense of revelation, where all of a sudden we begin to see God in a whole new dimension. And I've been sharing this from time to time in various ways that I believe with everything within me, this is a time when we need to have a greater revelation of our God. Amen? He is the great God. He is the God who sits on the throne of heaven. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the awesome God. And the word awesome God in the New King James is translated from the King James Version because it uses the word terrible. And when you say, you serve a terrible God, how many know that don't sound good? But the connotation of that word is, if God is on your side, that's wonderful. If he's your enemy, that's terrible. And that's what the word awesome literally means. God is God over everything, and we must recognize how important it is that we would recognize him as who he is. And that's when we come to the place of worship, and I believe that God wants to bring us into a greater place of worship than we've walked in before. It says, let us kneel before the Lord our maker. The word worship literally means to bow down. 
So it has the connotation that when you come and see who God is, you can't help but to prostrate yourself before him. Worship is when you're like, wow, can hardly stand in the presence of the awesomeness of who our God is. Now, corresponding with this in this psalm, it says, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years, I was grieved with that generation and said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts. They do not know my way, so I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. God showed himself in such awesome ways to the children of Israel. Can you imagine him sending the 10 plagues upon the Egyptians so that you could get deliverance? And I can't even imagine how awesome that was to see the Red Sea part so that they could go over on dry land so that if afterwards the Lord could destroy their enemies. How many know that's an awesome God? Amen? God fed them with manna from heaven. He sent quail for them to eat when they were looking for meat. He gave them water from a rock. All these awesome things. But the story of the children of Israel is in all of their crisis situations that they were going through, what they did is they hardened their heart. And because they hardened their heart, they could not hear the voice of God. And that's why it says in the book of Hebrews, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, just like you did in the day when you were troubled or in the day of provocation when you were provoked. God wants us to recognize how important it is that whatever we're going through, we got to make sure that we're giving him our heart. Amen? and that we're keeping our heart soft before him so that our heart can receive the word from God, and in that we can come to the place of rest. And I really believe with all my heart that the greatest testimony that the church is going to have in these days of struggle is that we're going to be the place of rest. We're going to be the place of peace. People are going to come to the house of God, and they're going to find it as a place of refuge. But I believe it, taking that a step farther, it's going to be like with Jesus Christ ministering. And this is what God is calling us to as the sons of God, that people could find rest when they came to him. How many know God wants you to take what you have in the house of God to the streets? Amen? And that's what the story that we read about today is about a woman who had an encounter with God. And in that encounter with God, something happened to her that she could take out on the street, so to speak. And she caused a great revival and a turning in a whole city. And that's where we'll continue to walk with. Now in John chapter 4, it says, Jesus said to the woman, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. Now, when Jesus first spoke to her, as we read in the opening scriptures, the Bible says that she was surprised because she said to him, what are you doing talking to me? Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. The Jews looked at the Samaritans as people who had kind of a fake religion. It was kind of a mixture of Judaism, but they had put all kinds of other things in their religion. And some of them didn't believe that they were truly uh, purebred people, if you would, because in the times of the wars the country had been through, the Syrians especially would take people into captivity, and then they would send a whole new people to take their place. And so they just looked down on the Samaritans, and she was surprised about that. But Jesus was willing to reach beyond the prejudice. Amen? He wasn't... Uh, going to be held in by his social prejudice, by his prejudice on gender or his prejudice on ethnics. He understood as he wanted to convey to us how important it is that we'd reach out to everybody that we possibly can. So as he's reaching out to this woman, he begins to steer the questions in a direction where he can point to her some spiritual things. How do you know he had a strategy here? And when you're going to win somebody to the Lord, how many know you need to have a strategy? The Bible says that we should be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, so that we have this understanding that we're trying to reach somebody so that we can bring them into the kingdom of God. So we be sure he's bringing her in. He talks to her about the water that they're drinking, and yet he makes it spiritual because he says, woman, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me, and I would give to you a well of living water you'd never thirst again. 
Now, at that particular time, she's not very spiritually perceptive at all. She's kind of like, like, how is that going to work? You don't even have a bucket. How are you going to get water for me or for yourself or anything else? And that's when Jesus began to turn the direction and said to her, go call your husband, bring him here, because he knew something. He knew the woman's personal life. And that's why he said, bring your husband back. He knew she didn't have a husband. She had been married five times. Now she's living with somebody. And now Jesus has kind of opened up a can of worms, I'm sure. But the important thing is he was letting her know that he knew things about her life that obviously she hadn't told him about. So the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. You Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. And so she starts to ask him a religious question. The Jews were worshiping God on Mount Zion. That's where David had uh, pitched the tent. That's where eventually they built the tabernacle. And they worshiped on a whole different uh, mountain altogether. And so she's trying to bring him into the political discussion here. But one of the things that is important to understand is she started asking him these things because why? She perceived that he was a prophet. Now, I want to talk a little bit about prophetic ministry because this is a very important observation in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But if all prophesy, an unbeliever, uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. And what happens now? The secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Usually when we think of prophecy, there's a scripture that says that it's for exhortation, edification, for comfort, and that it truly is. But there's also this dimension of prophecy where it brings revelation to somebody concerning their heart. Because a prophecy has went forth, whether it's in a congregation, whether it's personally. In this particular situation, Jesus used what we would call today a word of knowledge because he didn't start saying, thus saith the Lord to you. But he did tell her information that only he could have known from the Father. And so there was a revelation of her heart in this situation. And so this is a very important aspect of prophecy and also very, very important as we're thinking about coming into a place of worship and praise before the Lord. So I want you to see how important the prophetic is and how important it is that we understand God uses that to what? Reveal the secrets of heart. And what does it do? It calls, causes us to fall down and truly come to the place of worship that God has for us. And that's why, especially here on Wednesday night, as we open ourselves up to the prophetic word and as we allow God to move upon our hearts, we should always be careful to listen to what God is speaking to us so that our hearts can be revealed in the middle of the situation. Now, I would like to point out how important it is for us to see here that Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. For you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is a what? Spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and also truth. Now, the word truth literally means something that's not concealing anything. Now, Jesus spoke about his word, and he said, my word is true. Father, sanctify them by your truth. And then he went on to say, my word is truth. So we know that anything concerning the scriptures is truth. But how many know when the word comes to our heart and we open up ourselves to God, then we have exposed our heart to what? Truth. And what God says to us is he said, now the time is now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, obviously, he was talking to her about the transition that they were going to go through from being Jews to moving into the new faith that God was having in the new covenant. But also, I really believe with all my heart that we can see that there's more that God wants to bring to the body of Christ today than we've ever experienced before. Now is the time that God is saying to the church, 
We're going to begin to move into a time, says the Lord, where we'll truly worship him in spirit and what? Truth. Understanding how important it is to let the word of God come to us, reveal our hearts to us so that we can give our heart to God. Not being like the children of Israel who, when they were going through their difficulties, they did which is very natural, something that people do very oftentimes, and that is they harden their heart. And sometimes we think that's the best solution for a problem because we're going through something and we have negative feelings or we've been broken in some way, so we think, well, i got to tough it up and get through this situation. But the Lord says, no, I want you to always give me your heart. When we talk about coming to the Lord, how you know we often use the term, I gave my heart to Jesus. Unfortunately, we give it to him and then we want it back. <laughs> or sometimes we take it back without realizing it. But when we look at it that we've given our heart to him, that should be seen as a foundation of our Christian experience and we don't take it back. That we understand in every situation that we're going through, if we allow the Holy Spirit and the word to come together, it can produce that transparency within us and give us an opportunity for transparency before God so that we're not holding anything in our heart, but we're allowing everything within our heart to be revealed and not concealed. And it's only in that place that we can truly come to that place where we worship God in spirit and in truth. And this is what God wanted to do to this woman. Woman, it's time for you to believe for something that you've never believed for before in order that your life may be transformed. In Matthew chapter 13, it says, In them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, seeing you shall see and not perceive. Why is that? For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. I think this is one of the scriptures I use most frequently in talking about giving our hearts to the Lord because it's such a sad commentary that when Jesus Christ came, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Why was that? Well, because just like in the wilderness, they had hardened their heart. And just like in the wilderness, they couldn't hear the voice of God anymore. They couldn't see or be perceptive of what it is that God was actually doing. And because of that, they could not hear or understand. That's why it's so important that we would understand how our heart is such a key component to hearing the voice of God, to seeing the things that God wants us to see, and also letting him work in our heart that we can have that transparency. Because transparency on the inside will bring transparency in what we see around us. And so as we allow ourselves to be drawn into this dimension of life, our heart condition can change everything about our perception and what we're hearing around us. And that's why I like to reference this from time to time, how important it is for us to understand the difference between preaching and teaching. How then shall they call in him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Wherever Jesus went, he went both preaching and teaching. Teaching is obviously the conveying of knowledge and information, but preaching is much more than that. Preaching is not the style of teaching. When I grew up in a church, they used to think that, well, you were teaching when you were kind of boring, preaching when you got a little excited. That's why I always laugh when I first started the church because people would come and they would say, you're more of a teacher than a preacher. <laughs> and I'd say, you're saying me, I'm boring, right? <laughs> it, it has nothing to do with the style, just like when I was talking about praise and worship last week. Praise and worship, it's not about the style, it's about the attitude of the heart. And the difference between preaching and teaching is in teaching, we're conveying information that's very important. But preaching is an art form where you what? You hear something. The word preach means to herald or proclaim. What are you heralding or proclaiming? A word that you have heard, a sound that has come to you from God. 
And that's why we always emphasize how important it is when we have people preach from this pulpit, if you would, this platform, we always tell people, you got to pray, you got to hear the voice of God. Amen? Because it not only says you got to preach, but how many of you know it also says you have to be sent? When I pray on Saturdays for our Sunday services or I pray today for our Wednesday service, I want the Lord to send me. I want the Lord to do something that has empowered me to think, you know what? I'm going with a message. And that message is something God has spoken from heaven. Can you say amen to that, church? And so we have to understand that because we always have to recognize that what we need to do is receive something that develops faith in us so that we can believe. Again, why? So that we can come to this place whereby we're worshiping God in spirit and in truth. So it's important to understand that when we talk about the prophetic word that reveals the heart of God, it's not just prophecy. It's whenever the word of the Lord is spoken and preaching is a part of that component. And that's why I was sharing like last week how important it is for us to see that our altar call really is our place of worship because we are responding to the word by the power of the Holy Spirit, conveying to God our intent to give him our heart in a whole new fashion. And when we allow that to actually work in us, so we don't want to get into the routine of it, it brings us to the place of worship. And this is a place that God wants to take us to like never before. I want to point out this scripture in John chapter 7. It says, On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. I want to add this scripture, of course, in the text, it talks about Jesus saying, I can give to you this living water. But in John chapter 7, the occasion of this is during the celebration of the festival of the tabernacles. Now, in the Old Testament, God was a God of threes that revealed himself in patterns that were very important. And one of those patterns is through the festivals. There was a festival of Passover, there was the festival of Pentecost, and finally, the one called Tabernacles. As you know, as we talked about Easter, when Jesus Christ, the night in which he was betrayed, he was celebrating the Passover feast. That was a part of the Passover celebration. Fifty days after Easter, the Christian church always celebrates Pentecost Sunday because that's the day we commemorate the Pentecostal service and experience, but it also corresponds to the Old Testament experience. But the third experience in the Old Testament was the Festival of Tabernacles, and that was also called the Wine Festival or the Wine Harvest or the time of the great ingathering. And this is something we have to understand prophetically God is bringing us into right now. And it was on that festival that Jesus cried out and said, if you would just come to me, don't you realize that out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water? Now, we know that he's talking about the Holy Spirit here. And how do you know when we receive the Holy Spirit, it begins to flow out? That's how we pray in tongues. That's why we have a Holy Spirit service where we practice this in our regular basis because the Bible says when we pray in tongues, our spirit prays, our understanding is unfruitful. But there's also a place where we begin to realize that God doesn't just want us to have this exercise of praying in tongues or even other verbal communications that are just for our self-edification. But God wants a well, a river, to flow from us that becomes a life-giving spirit to the world that's around us. And church, this is what the world is looking for right now, and this is what God is saying to the church. We have to understand, as never before, how important it is that we would be a people that begin to pour out from our heart, from our innermost being, this living water, because it's this living water that's coming from us that's going to bring a transformation to the world in which we live in such a great harvest. The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him. Why? Because of the word of the woman who testified. 
I really believe this first part, the woman left her water pot, because that's symbolic of the fact that God was saying, you got to have a new mindset on how you're going to draw the water. This is not a natural thing. This is a spiritual thing, says the Lord. And God is saying to the church, I'm inviting you to a greater place of worship, a greater place of the revelation of your heart and the truth coming in so that the river that I have put within you, says the mighty God, can begin to spring forth like a well, a well that you've never experienced before, that you can be like the woman at the well who after she experienced her encounter with Jesus began to pour out from herself a fountain of life, literally transforming a city. Church, this is a time when we're going to see the greatest harvest we've ever seen before. Amen? And this harvest is going to be because each and every member of the body of Christ is going to come to the place of revelation. There's life inside of me, and there's life inside of me that the world needs and I'm going to become that well of living water to change my city, to change my world, to change my nation. It's time. Can we all bow our heads and close our eyes for just a moment as we prepare ourselves for our gathering together of worship where we give God our heart and we allow his presence to come in as never before. Now, this is a Holy Spirit service, and so I want us to begin to pray in the Spirit. The Bible says, when I pray in the Spirit, my spirit is praying. And I want you to be aware that that just let you know there's a fountain inside of you and the well's beginning to bubble up. The river, the well... Not only will you never thirst again, but God says, I have called you to be a living fountain, a fountain to change your world. If you see death, God says, you've got the antidote. If you see turmoil, this river brings peace. It brings rest. You have the antidote. It's inside of you. It's time to spring forth. It's time to spring forth. O repara shandri akura bashate arla bashandri O repri ashandri akote kombra bashata la basita rabashandai O te amasita lai masandali ako Hallelujah 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, the presence of the Lord is so here. It's a new day. It's a new season. It's a new flow, says the mighty God. Out of your innermost being, out of your heart shall flow a river of living water, says the mighty God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy to be praised. Almighty God, hallelujah. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, as you're sitting in the presence of the Lord, it's all about the heart. Is there a hard place there? Is there a broken place there? You can't do anything about changing it, but you can give it to God. When the children of Israel were provoked, they hardened themselves that they would resist the provoking. 
that God said, it's time for me to get beyond the scar tissue, so to speak. Give him your scar tissue, if you would. Some of you knows what I'm talking about right now. Just let the anointing of God speak to you right now. It's time to give him that scar tissue. That place that you hardened yourself in the struggle. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I give you my heart, I give you my soul. I give you my heart, almighty God. Come, come, O living fountain. Come, O living fountain, come. Now let's all stand to our feet right now, and we're going to open the altar. And I want you to come and say, Lord, I want to go forth, and I want to become a worshiper. I want to give you my heart fully. I want you to come to every broken place, every scar tissue, everything that would hinder me from just being fully exposed to the truth. I want to worship you in spirit and in truth. You, that's what you're looking for, and that's what I want to give, Father. 